She's a senior research clinician for DTHF and she's based in Philippi Village in Cape Town. She's been working in the field of HIV treatment and care since 2004 when ARVs were first being rolled out in South Africa. And she started the first pediatric and adolescent HIV clinic for right to care in Gauteng. She's now passionate about HIV prevention and is currently involved in the Fast Prep program and other HIV prevention clinical trials. Thank you so much, Pippa. Good morning, everyone. It's um, it's wonderful to be here on day two of the conference. It's a Friday, um, and I can just see everyone's feeling happy and excited. And we've got such a great session ahead. Um, we're going to be starting um, with a talk about adolescent sexual and reproductive health, some of the challenges and some of the innovations, and then we're going to talk about sexual pleasure, which is going to be a very, very interesting talk, and I'm sure going to inspire a lot of discussion and a lot of questions. So I can't wait for that. <laughs> um, so let's go into the first presentation. I will introduce the panelists when it's time for them to join us. This presentation was meant to be done by Dr. Catherine Gill, who would have loved to have been here. Um, but unfortunately is not able to. I'm going to tell you about her anyway, because she did um, produce the slides, prepare the slides. She's a medical doctor, public health specialist, senior researcher at the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, specializing in HIV prevention, clinical trials, adolescent and STI research. She's been a medical doctor for 20 years and has more than 10 years experience running a clinical trial site in Cape Town. And I'm sure many of us know it, um, called Massey. Because Catherine isn't here and she's got such big shoes to fill, two of us decided to take on her presentation. So I'm going to ask Runzu, um, one of our colleagues, to come and join me up here. There she is. And I'm going to, I have the pleasure of introducing her as well. So Runzu is a senior medical officer, also a DTHF, also based at Massey with Catherine. She works in various HIV prevention studies, STI clinical research trials. She has been the PI for Purpose um, when she worked at Emma Bundleni um, and has now crossed over to MASI where she's currently a sub-investigator on the vaginal microbiome well, study, vaginal microbiome study, which you're going to hear about in the upcoming presentation. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Ranzu first of all. I think I might need to move because you might not be able to see me over there. <laughs> so I'll be doing the presentation for Dr. Gil um, on the innovations for adolescent sexual and, and reproductive health. How we're going to do the presentation is that I will do the first part, which is uh, basically um, outlining the challenges that the adolescents have, and I'll hand over to Dr. McDonald to do the actual innovations. So that is actually a picture of the youth camp at the site. You know? So this snapshot, this snapshot infographic is um, an overview, provides an overview of the national data relating to the sexual and reproductive health rights of South Africa. This is data from 2021. So the slides that follow also are from the, uh, the uh, infographic. Okay. So the first challenge is, is that of contraception, basically. There's an unmet need of for contraception. As you can see on, this, on the slide that the adolescent birth rate for 2021, 67.9 per 100,000 women aged 15 to 19 gave birth in that age of 29. And it has been shown that the earlier women um, fall pregnant in their reproductive life, it leads to more complications in their pregnancies, um, which may include death during pregnancy, which you see by the 
my maternal uh, mortality that was 119 per 100,000 live births in South Africa in 2000 in 2021. The second challenge that we identified is that of HIV prevention. So for um on the slides as you can see for the young women um adolescent women yeah aged from the uh, age 15 to 29 there were 55,000 new HIV infections. I mean, compared to the, also the male counterparts from the 15 to 29 were also 15,000. But um, the other thing that we showed out is that they ha had um, multiple partners, 68.1% of the males had multiple partners and there were also inconsistent use of condoms. Okay. The other I mean thing is that the knowledge of HIV prevention methods were less than 50% in both uh, men and women at the age of 15 to 29. So again, looking back to the 95, 95, 95 HIV targets, um, as much as the people that have no, that are HIV positive know this, that they're getting tested and they know their status, and those that are, that do know their status are on uh, HIV treatment, the, the adherence and viral suppression remains a challenge. As you can see, only 69% of the females um, knew, who knew their status, who were on a uh, hard head were virally suppressed. So as much as this slide is not as specific to adolescents, it, is, it has been shown that adolescents usually struggle with adherence and linkage to care. The other challenge that we identified was also about um, cervical cancer and HPV. So in, in South Africa, we do have um, an HPV vaccine program. We do have screening for cervical cancer, but the coverage nationally still remains a, a, a challenge. So the goal is, the, is to have more than 80% coverage, but we're currently at between 50 and 70%. So fifth challenge uh, is STIs, but this was not actually mentioned on the on the infographic that I showed. But we do know that um, young women do struggle with having HIV, um, with sexual transmitted HIV, sexual transmitted infections, and um, each year about three hundred and thirty-three million new in, uh, cases between the age of twenty and to twenty-four. Um, no. So in the ground that in the studies that we do 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 have we have seen that um there is a lot of HIV infect I'm sorry sexual transmitted infections excluding HIV. So in summary, the challenges that I spoke about will be um HIV, which is HIV prevention and HIV treatment, cervical cancer, um challenges with concentration leading to a high rate of adolescent um, birth rates and maternal mortality, and also STIs. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Dr. McDonald to actually speak about the innovation regarding all this that will tackle these challenges. Thanks, Ranzi. So the first thing to talk about, obviously, with this background worry of the high number of teenage pregnancies is innovations in contraception. So if it's an innovation, we want it to be possibly more effective, safer, or easier to use. Um, and there are some things um, out there, maybe not quite in South Africa yet. Um, there's the new birth control ring called the Anovira, which can actually be used for up to a year. So it's inserted, it's a vaginal ring, stays in for three weeks and is then taken out for seven days, usually when women have their periods. Then the same ring, it's obviously washed, dried, kept in this little pouch, can then be reinserted and used for 12 months. So that's a great innovation. Um, there's a new patch with lower level of hormones. There is a progestin-only pill, which is also said to be more forgiving than some of the other ones. And by that, 
I mean that if you take your pill a little bit late, um, it's better. It's more forgiving. You don't have to have taken it within that three-hour window. Male birth control doesn't seem to be advancing quite as fast as females. And I absolutely love Catherine's sense of humor here when she says they're really str struggling to find something that doesn't cause a low sex drive, doesn't cause depression. Because obviously, as women, we don't struggle with that sort of thing when they're looking at our innovations. <laughs> female condoms, um, also an innovation there, is a female condom that can be inserted like a tampon with an applicator. So much easier to insert than the female condoms that we're used to. A new copper IUD that can prolong the release and possibly reduce side effects like bleeding, which we know we have a lot of with the current IUD. And better patches. Um, these are contraceptive patches that are less irritant, stay on better. So there are innovations regarding contraception. HIV treatment, and we spoke about this a lot yesterday. The Affinity Study is a study in adolescents aged 12 to 24. Um, where they are looking at using, well, where they are using CAB combined with rilpivirine, it's two separate injections, as HIV treatment. Very exciting, and the study really is looking at the acceptability and tolerability of these intramuscular injections, the feasibility of delivering them in our community settings, and also adherence. Are these two monthly treatment injections going to improve adherence. I think we all think we know what it'll do. Um, but it'll be interesting to see the results and the outcomes of the affinity study. We spoke yesterday about purpose. And as I mentioned, Runzu was actually the principal investigator at our site in Philippi for Purpose One, um, which is using Lena Kapova. That's the six monthly subcut injection um, as HIV prevention. Six monthly subcut. That's a real innovation. Purpose two is doing the same um, in MSM and transgender women. Moving on to innovations in preventing cervical cancer. We all know, and as Ranzu mentioned, um, our target of getting 80% of eligible girls vaccinated with the Cervarix vaccine has not been very successful so far. It's been around since 2014, and we don't seem to be getting enough girls vaccinated. All provinces are currently below target. One of the innovations to talk about here is the Gardasil 9 vaccine, which protects against nine strains, not just the two, 16 and 18. It includes protection against genital warts, and HPV causing head, neck, and anal cancers. It's also been shown recently, which I think is very exciting, that one dose is as effective as two doses. So also an innovation, but we do need innovations about being able to reach those young girls at school. And I know some countries also reach young boys and young men, which we don't do here. And then STIs, which are very, very close to all our hearts. There just are too many STIs in our young population. And so many of them are being missed because our participants are asymptomatic. More than 1 million STIs are acquired every single day worldwide, the majority of which are asymptomatic. That means an estimated 374 million new infections and one in four are completely curable. That's chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, trichomonas. All are completely curable. More than 500 million people between the ages of 15 and 49 are estimated to have a genital infection with herpes simplex virus. Almost one million pregnant women were estimated to be infected with syphilis in 2016, which result resulting in over 350,000 adverse birth outcomes. And just on the side here, we are currently um, doing a study in our mobile units in the Clipfontaine 
Mitchell's Plain District. And we just started in the last month or so doing rapid syphilis testing. And um, I'm sure Devorah will speak a little bit about this later, but we are absolutely amazed and dare I say horrified at the number of positive syphilis participants that we have. I think it's something that has been not spoken about. We don't think it's out there, but it really is. The other thing to think about with STIs is the drug resistance, particularly with keptriaxone, treating gonorrhea, um, that, that is also growing and a major threat. Syndromic management, I'm sure most of us are very used to that. We use it a lot still in all our clinics. When I talk about syndromic treatment, when a participant comes, they've got STI symptoms, and we often give them, if it's a woman with a vaginal discharge, for example, we will give them three different medicines, metronidazole, azithromycin, and keftriaxone, hoping that those three will get the one that's causing that vaginal discharge. But as I said earlier, there are so many of our participants who are asymptomatic. So this really doesn't help there for obvious reasons. We're also overtreating if we're giving three medicines and our participant actually has chlamydia and only needs azithromycin. There's a financial impact giving three meds when only one is needed. And of course, increasing resistance is a big issue when you're giving three meds that you might not need to. So what are the innovations here? Doxypep. Doxypep is one of the new, um, new lingo that's out there that we're talking about. It's a way to protect against bacterial STIs after an exposure. So if you have sex, feel that you are at risk of getting an STI, Doxypep is an option to be used. It has to be used within 72 hours um, after an episode of sex without a condom. However, it's not as perfect and as easy as it sounds. Um, it does seem to be very effective, particularly against syphilis prevention and chlamydia prevention, but not as effective against gonorrhea. It is, however, safe. It has a good resistance profile, but most of our studies so far have been in the MSM population and studies in women doesn't seem to be quite as effective. And just to mention here that, as Catherine wrote, reducing STIs will reduce HIV. I cannot state how important it is that untreated STIs make our adolescents, make all of us, much more vulnerable and susceptible to getting HIV. So we need to address these STIs in innovative new ways. Um, and this was from a recent plenary session and I know it's a busy slide, but if you look at that bottom blue box there, the short-term benef benefits of doxypep, um, strong reduction of syphilis and chlamydia, but the impact on gonorrhea likely to be limited um, and also predominantly in men in the, pop in the MSM population so far. An innovation for gonorrhea, now this is something that we're also very excited, both at Massey and at the clinic I work at, Emma Vindlany, because we are about to be starting a study early next year where we are going to be giving a vaccine that we hope and we think is going to prevent gonorrhea. There have been two big studies that have so far shown a 40% reduction in gonorrhea in people vaccinated with this vaccine. And of interest, it's the same vaccine that's used for meningitis, um, also caused by the Neisseria um, bacteria. So an innovation, exciting. Who has heard of the vaginal microbiome? Also something that's been, <laughs> saw a few hands go up, also been spoken about a lot recently. And for those of you who have not heard about it, it's the name for all the microbes that are present in the vagina, bacteria, viruses, fungi. And I'm sure all us women know that having healthy bacteria, viruses, fungi in our vaginas is a good thing. I don't know how much men know about vaginas, but that's what I'm here to is to educate you. 
Okay, so these healthy microbiomes keep the pH low and that delicate balance that prevents overgrowth of fungi bacteria causing STIs, causing discomfort, causing symptoms, and of course, making women more vulnerable and at risk of getting HIV. So to keep a healthy microbiome in that vagina is very, very important. So there is the VMRC, the Vaginal Microbiome Consortium for Africa, and they've established a platform for collaborating all of these studies. They're doing regionally relevant vaginal, stu vaginal microbiome studies, because obviously in different parts of the world, the studies will be different, the flora will be different. Um, they're doing vaginal product testing. And you can see on that map, I hope down at the bottom, there we are, DTHF. And um, there is a study happening at the moment at Massey. Um, the study is looking at 100 women per site identifying with persistently lactobacillus dominated microbiomes through two menstrual cycles. And what they're hoping to do is find this microbiome, the best strain to eventually develop a potential probiotic that can be protective and help that vaginal microbiome and by so doing, prevent STIs, help prevent HIV. Um, I have a feeling that Linda Gale will probably want to talk a little bit about that later because it's very exciting, um, but I'll move on for now. So the final slide, um, five very important take home points. The adolescent birth rate is high. We know that, we worried about that. Innovations are necessary and needed in this country, um, innovations in contraception to prevent this. We all know HIV remains a very serious challenge in South Africa, especially for young women, and we need innovations for longer acting treatment options like Carbotegrava, Lenacapiva, and of course, I'm gonna just put my hand up and mention that DAPI ring again, because I'm a huge supporter. Um, and STIs. We didn't speak about STIs really at all yesterday, so I'm so pleased that the floor is now going to be open for a bit later to talk more about STIs, but we do need innovation there to control that silent epidemic. Right now the glasses go back on, and um, it's time for me to be chair again. So we're not going to ask any questions yet. Um, I'm now going to hand you over for our very exciting session to Kylie Murray. She is a feminist anthropologist, a pleasure activist, and a PhD candidate at the University of Cape Town. Her research critically explores the sexual subject subjectivities of colored women from Cape Town through the lens of sexual pleasure. Welcome, we are so happy to have you. Can't wait for your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here today and thank you to Dr. McDonald for that introduction. Just to rehash, my name is Kylie Marie. I am a feminist anthropologist, a pleasure activist, and a final year PhD candidate at the University of Cape Town. <laughs> I have also recently become a pleasure fellow for the Pleasure Project. For those who may not know, the Pleasure Project was established in 2004 and has since become the world's leading organization that seeks to put the sexy back into safer sex. Their aim is to bridge the gap between the public health world and the sex and pleasure industry. They've also helped to develop the evidence base for a sex positive and pleasure based approach to sexual health and rights. Today, my mission is to spread the word of pleasure and to advocate for why I think we could all, or why we all need to adopt a pleasure perspective in our respective fields. In addition, I will briefly outline my own research study on female sexual pleasure and will also then at the end provide 10 tips on how we can all include pleasure into our own work. 
But before we begin, I have a bit of a confession. For the last few years, I've been thinking about sex a lot. <laughs> More specifically, I've been thinking about how we think about sex and the meanings that we attach to words and behaviors related to sex, especially within the context of South Africa. What I have come to learn is that in our country, sex has a complicated past and present. On the one hand, history reveals that sex in South Africa was intimately tied to complex ideas related to gender, sexuality, race, and class. Racial hierarchies were violently upheld and strict laws were established that kept certain couples apart and sexual desires at bay. On the other hand, in contemporary South Africa, sex is publicly portrayed in the media via television shows, books and magazines, and also as evident from the abundant sex toy companies we have in this country. However, for many of us, including adolescents, how we come to learn about sex, whether at home, at school, or via other programs, is often in relation to teenage pregnancy, sexual health, and sexual violence. While these are, of course, crucial topics to teach young people, they tend to position sex within a largely sex-negative framework, which reduces sex to risk. Sex then becomes something to avoid, abstain from, or even fear. Moreover, our understandings of sex is often gendered and framed within patriarchal and heteronormative lenses. For many of us, especially during our adolescent years, sex is also regulated by religious models and respectable ideologies, which also emphasizes a sex negative lens. In South Africa, sex is thus really understood in relation to sexual pleasure or other sex positive topics. As a result, we are perpetuating a single narrative of sex, one that focuses on danger, damage, and disease, and strips sex of sexual pleasure and agency. But why does this matter? Because sexual pleasure is one of the primary motivators for engaging in sexual activities. In other words, many of us, adolescents included, engage in sexual activities, whether on their own or with partners, because it feels good and is hopefully pleasurable. However, sexual pleasure is a topic that remains taboo, is seriously under-researched and often challenging to talk about. Female sexual pleasure is even more taboo and is not only underrepresented in South Africa, but also barely studied within anthropology. And this motivated me to explore this topic a bit further. So for my doctoral research study in feminist anthropology, I set out to critically explore the sexual subjectivities of contemporary colored women from Cape Town, South Africa, via pleasure narratives. Between 2018 and 2019, I interviewed 15 self-identified colored cisgender women between the ages of 22 and 40 about their subjective meanings and lived experiences of sex, sexuality, and sexual pleasure. I also included myself as a participant since I met the demographic. Through individual in-depth interviews, I listened to each woman share personal and private stories about their sex lives. I then compiled these stories into pleasure narratives in an attempt to understand how women come to learn about, embody, and experience sexual pleasure in their lives. I knew this research would be challenging, especially since sex and sexual pleasure were not topics that we were used to speaking about, let alone comfortable speaking about. Instead, sexuality for myself and my participants were deeply tied to histories of sexual shame, sexual silence, and sexual violence. However, through this research, I discovered that women wanted to talk about, sex, about their sex lives. Many had just never been asked about it or had never been given a safe space to explore these conversations. What I learned from my participants, pleasure narratives, as well as my own, was that there were several sociocultural factors that both constructed and constrained our perceptions of pleasure. For instance, our sexual enculturation, such as the beliefs and the norms that we learn at a young age, our experiences of sexual violence, the sex-related discourses and tools that we gain over time and gain access to over time, whether it's from school or the internet, as well as our sexual experiences with ourselves or our partners, all to varying degrees influence our perceptions of pleasure and our sexual subjectivities. Shame was notably a major theme in the women's pleasure narratives. This embodied constraint made it challenging but not impossible to regard, the, to regard themselves as sexual beings and embrace sexual pleasure. But what is sexual pleasure anyway? 
Sexual pleasure has been widely documented and researched from a diverse range of disciplines. Based on these studies, sexual pleasure is broadly defined as involving the positive feelings that arise from sexual stimuli and may result from a, variety, a wide variety of activities that involve sexual arousal, genital stimulation, and or orgasm. Sexual pleasure can also be pursued in many forms and can occur in both partnered and or solitary contexts. Within the global community, sexual pleasure has even been advocated as a human sexual right. Sexual pleasure, for instance, is recognized by the World Health Organization because according to them, sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences, free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. In 2019, the World Association of Sexual Health, or WAS, also endorsed a declaration of sexual pleasure. This declaration sought to highlight the importance of pleasure as an integral element of sexual health and well-being. But why is it important for individuals? Sexual pleasure is deeply subjective and encompasses physical, emotional, psychological sensations of enjoyment and satisfaction related to sexual activity. It involves a deep sense of connection, intimacy, and well-being, and can manifest in various forms, like through touch, communication, and emotional bonding. Sexual pleasure is crucial for individuals because it plays an important role in fostering self-esteem and body image by enabling individuals to embrace and enjoy their bodies. Pleasure can also enhance trust between partners and promote overall well-being and happiness. It can be a source of stress relief, as we may or may not know, and improve one's overall mental and physical health. Lastly, sexual pleasure has the ability to liberate and empower people, young and old. Why is it important for adolescent sexual and reproductive health in South Africa? The importance of sexual pleasure in South Africa lies in challenging this, the historical oppression, stigma, and discrimination that have limited sexual autonomy and pleasure for many individuals, and that continue to influence adolescent sexuality today. But given our very complex history of sex and our current realities of sexual health and violence in our country, it is no surprise that we would rather warn our adolescents about the risks of sex than teach them about how pleasurable, sexy, fun, and empowering sex can be. We fear that by preaching about pleasure, we will encourage probably risky and reckless adolescent sexual behavior. However, research has shown that including pleasure in sex education helps to improve people's knowledge and attitudes about it, promotes greater body awareness, and leads to safer sex practices and improves compliance with condom use. By acknowledging the importance of pleasure, healthcare providers can subsequently offer more relevant and effective services, ensuring that adolescents receive information and support that caters for their sexual and emotional needs. This approach can lead to both safer and more satisfying sexual experiences, reducing the risks of unwanted pregnancies and STIs, and promoting overall well being among young people. We also gain more when we begin to consider adoles adolescents as sexual agents rather than as sexual objects, problems, or victims. Because whether we want to acknowledge it or not, adolescents are engaging in sexual activities. In fact, adolescence is a period of critical importance for psychosocial, psychosexual development as, increasing curios as increased curiosity, exploration, and involvement in the relation and sexual spheres contributes to shaping a person's sexual sense of self. Evidence suggests that adolescents engage in practices that follow a linear trajectory from autoerotic behaviors to activities with sexual partners that progress from holding hands, hugging, and kissing to more intimate touching and genital sexual behaviors. Recent studies also show that a growing number of adolescents integrate digital technologies in their sexual life, as many report watching porn or engaging in sexting. However, very little attention is given to the diversity of sexual experiences in adolescents. Within South Africa, as I have highlighted, sexual pleasure tends to take a backseat to other more socially pertinent sexual health problems such as HIV, AIDS, gender-based violence, and teenage pregnancy. The aim, of course, is not to replace your work, but to reframe it by adopting a pleasure perspective. This means applying a lens within your work that is sex-positive, pleasure-based, and empathic in its approach. By sex-positive, I mean embracing and celebrating the broad spectrum of human sexual diversity 
and emphasizing consent, autonomy, and sexual rights. By pleasure-based, I am referring to an approach that focuses on well-being, safety, pleasure, desire, and joy, as well as empowerment, agency, and self-efficacy. And lastly, by empathy, I mean connecting with people on an emotional level, acknowledging their feelings, experiences, and perspectives, as well as striving to comprehend the social, cultural, and personal context that shapes these experiences. The, sec the pleasure perspective is therefore vital because it transforms how we think and feel about sex, and with that, sexual health. When we adopt the pleasure perspective, we begin to empower people to reclaim their bodies, desires, and identities, contributing to a more inclusive and equitable society. But how can we adopt a pleasure perspective in our own work? So recently, the Pleasure Project teamed up with two other organizations, Amplify Change and The Case for Her, to create a document that highlights 10 tips for including pleasure in your work. Today, I would like to share these 10 tips with you together with some of my own research experiences so that we can hopefully all begin to adopt pleasure perspectives within our own work. This document can be downloaded for free on the Pleasure Project website. So theme one, before you begin, assuming and honoring. Tip one is to keep an open mind about how closed or open people, groups, and communities may be to pleasure and let this be reflected in your approach. Some groups, especially adolescents, sometimes view, are sometimes viewed as out of reach of the pleasure perspective. The assumption is that talking about pleasure would be uncomfortable or even impossible for these groups. However, by not making assumptions, we allow individuals and groups to decide their own response to the pleasure approach. Another important note is that sometimes sexual pleasure is difficult to talk about, not just because it is associated with taboo, but also because we've never been asked questions about our sexual pleasure. So we lack the language or the words to adequately explain our sexual beliefs and experiences. It is therefore important that we find empathic and sensitive ways to ask about people's pleasure perceptions before we delve into our work. Tip two, honor the pleasure work that is already being done. It may not be named or recognized as, as pleasure approach work, but it may already exist. So where there is already pleasure work being done, this should be acknowledged. As a pleasure implementer, you should consider using the existing work as a valuable way of talking about pleasure in your setting. You may also want to look into your local, con into your local con context to identify other organizations, resources, or practices, as there may be sex positive approaches already being implemented around you. Theme two, sexy talk, language and voice. The third tip, where use of local languages sounds offensive or sex negative when talking about pleasure, use a mix of languages or comfortable slang words as alternatives. In some cases, you may want to choose a combination of English and other local languages to get around this challenge. Another option is to adopt internet slang or use emojis to refer to genitals. As we know, the peach emoji is for buttocks and the eggplant is for, you all know. Ultimately, you want to be creative since you know your audience best. Tip four, if jumping straight into pleasure is uncomfortable, introduce pleasure slowly into a conversation through dis discussion topics that feel safe. Consider exploring topics that feel safe to introduce. Perhaps think around respecting and understanding other people's responses. Sorry, not responses, sensations, experiences, desires, and bodies. As this can allow a pleasure approach to be introduced more seamlessly and comfortably. For my own research, I found that simply asking people about their meanings and definitions of pleasure was quite helpful. For example, what makes you feel good? Why do you engage in sex? Does sexual pleasure matter to you? Tip five, address resistance to introducing pleasure by amplifying young people's voices. Sometimes, as I mentioned, people claim that a pleasure approach encourages adolescents to engage in sexual activities. However, it could be that young people want to talk about sex and sexual pleasure, but maybe, they, maybe they've grown up associating sex with shame or stigma, as I mentioned. Or perhaps information available on the internet is just too overwhelming to navigate. It could also be that adolescents do not have access to people they trust or people who won't shame them for being sexually curious and sexually careful. Furthermore, it is often our own discomforts that prevent us from creating safe spaces to speak about sex. 
It is therefore a helpful idea to reflect upon our own perceptions of pleasure. Consider asking yourself, what does sexual pleasure mean to you? What brings you pleasure? And what can I introduce, or how can I introduce more pleasure into my everyday life? The third theme is pleasure people, facilitators, and training. Tip six is to invest training those who facilitate the pleasure approach, such as youth educators, teachers, and even health professionals. As for many, this is a new topic and skill. I think it goes without saying that talking about pleasure can be new and scary, even for facilitators. I know that when I started my own research study, I would often blush and break out into panicky sweats every time someone asked me what my research was about. I especially feared sharing my research topic with my family, because what would my Oma think? I, it definitely took me some time to become this comfortable speaking about sex, let alone sexual pleasure. But once I began to see how my participants felt liberated and free just by sharing their pleasure narratives with me, this is when I, this is when I realized that speaking about pleasure can be easy. New facilitators of a pleasure approach will therefore need training as well as time and support to become comfortable, not only with talking about pleasure, but also knowing their own boundaries and sharing with others. I invite you to have a look at the pleasure project there are amazing resources online. This is an entire guide that you can download for free that walks you through step-by-step step how to become a pleasure implementer in your own work. Tip seven, provide your facilitators with ongoing support because learning to speak about pleasure is an ongoing process. Learning to be confident and comfortable talking about pleasure is a continuous journey. And new ways of appreciating pleasure may reveal themselves at different times. But as I found, once my own research participants expressed that they wished they had known all of this information when they were sexually active adolescents and young, and young adults, I began to realize the power of pleasure and the need for a pleasure perspective. I subsequently knew that I needed to make myself vulnerable in order to become comfortable speaking about this topic. Facilitators therefore need ongoing support to reinforce the pleasure journey. So, so, as to be oh, so be sure to stay up to date with the latest resources on the Pleasure Project website. As I said, they have a bunch of amazing resources that can help you along the way. Tip eight, find people that have the capacity to communicate positively and non-judgmentally about pleasure and sex. This is probably, in my opinion, the most important tip because people need safe spaces to share their most intimate and private sexual thoughts, feelings, and experiences with you. Facilitators who are judgmental and share negative or stigmatizing per perceptions of sex and pleasure are thus not yet able to facilitate a pleasure approach. Additional training would be needed to help them navigate their own meanings of sexual pleasure. Avoid judge avoiding judgment is essential, so try your best to be supportive and create an environment of trust. This is where empathy again plays a really big role. Put yourself in their shoes. Remember how it might have felt for you as a teenager to speak about taboo topics with older people. Tip nine, where facilitators can be vulnerable and offer up their own stories, joys, struggles with pleasure, people are more likely to share their own experiences in a group setting. As I have highlighted, being vulnerable and open about pleasure can be difficult. Facilitators can therefore, if they feel able to, model the ability to be vulnerable by sharing their own experience of experiences of pleasure. This does not mean sharing every single detail about your latest sexual adventure, but finding points of connection between your sexual stories. It is important to note that being vulnerable about your experiences with pleasure does not have to be explicit or even sexual. Sharing experiences should instead be done in a way that feels comfortable for facilitators and honors the safety and privacy boundaries. Showing people how to share safely and comfortably is thus key to modeling vulnerability. I definitely found this to be true within my own research because sharing my own sexual beliefs, insecurities, and experiences created a common ground between myself and my research participants, and this made it easier for them to share. I also did not push for information, but rather let the conversations flow. The final tip. In some cases, facilitators that are the same age and or gender as the group encourage more open discussions between these between the participants. Again, as my own research showed, many but not all women felt shy, intimidated, or judged when they were asked to speak about sex. Being a woman myself made it easier within our intimate interview spaces and enabled them to share more freely. 
Often we found that it was the conversations around our childhood beliefs around sexuality that created most common ground. Because no one wants to be okhat and we all shared bits and pieces about that. Having same gendered groups can thus allow young people to speak more freely about their experiences with pleasure. Similarly, young people may feel more comfortable in groups of the similar age and people with similar lived experiences or sexual and gender identities may feel more may feel more comfortable to have open conversations together. Finally, we urge that you please document and, and evaluate your pleasure work where possible, because this information can help to improve upon our own work and can also be used to inspire, encourage, and help others to share and adopt the pleasure perspective and approach. Lastly, I would love for you all to visit the Pleasure Project website. I. If anyone would like to see some of the resources, I have printed them out and I can show you what an example of these resources will look like after the after these talks. And I would also like to hand out one of these copies of the Pleasure Principles, which I think is a key document provided by the Pleasure Project that helps you with the initial journey of pleasure. And if you would like to learn more about the Pleasure Project, feel free to visit any of these links. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kylie, for sharing all your information and your research, and um, we will certainly have some questions later. So what we're going to be doing for the remainder of the session is I'm going to ask our three panelists to join us um, at the table. Um, we are then going to hear from them. They might ask a few questions about the presentations, tell us a bit about their research. After that, we will certainly open up to the floor for any questions. And after that, we have an artist interlude, some entertainment, um, which will also be very exciting before lunch. So if I can first of all introduce our panelists, um, I'm going to start with Lauren. Lauren Finn is a socio-behavioral scientist at the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation. She's conducting her PhD on adolescent sexual communication and its influence on STI partner notification. At the other side of the table is Dr. Devora Davey, who's an honorary senior lecturer in the Department of Biostats and Epidemiology at UCT. She received her master's degree in public health from Columbia University and her PhD in epidemiology from the University of California, Los Angeles. She has over 18 years experience in international health and extensive experience in the design, management and evaluation of HIV prevention and care, sexual reproductive health interventions and studies. Her current research focuses on evaluating how best to prevent HIV in pregnant and breastfeeding women, including STI diagnosis and treatment, and PrEP in pregnant and breastfeeding women. And Sipusetu Bota has just joined the table. She's a peer navigator working with us um, on our fast PrEP projects. And we're so pleased to have her here because she really is on the ground, working with participants, really understands all those challenges in sexual and reproductive health and talks to our participants directly. So we look forward to hearing from her too. But Lauren, can I start with you? Um, really just, as I said, STIs are, are so prevalent and, and being missed so often. And what we didn't speak about is male partners and how to notify male partners, um, how to try and get on top of this STI epidemic. Can you give us some insight um, into some of your research and, um, and what you're finding out? Let's see. That works better. Um, thank you, Dr. Pippa. I would I love being here. Um, and just to introduce the topic a little bit more, um, my interest in adolescent communication and particularly in STI um, notification is possibly as a result of all the past research that's been done in these areas. You'll have heard 
from both our presentations, the importance of um, ensuring uh, STI treatment for curable STIs, but also the role that we need to take in terms of changing the narrative that we have about um, STIs in pleasure and sex in our health research. Um, and a lot of the research that is currently being completed is a focus on um, adolescent girls, um, their peers, and mostly on parents. But I think that as researchers, we need to acknowledge that the person that I have sex with is my sexual partner. And in South Africa, we are not able to adequately not only locate our sexual partners, but our referral for treatment um, often results in STIs um, reinfection of our adolescent girls. And that's demonstrated in the numbers that we see in terms of our STI outcomes. And so, I mean, like I say, the, there's so much space and there's so much newness in this, this area that it's often difficult to say, where do we start and what do we do first? But for myself, I think that I should say that my PhD project is to um, approach our adolescent populations and ensure that we first understand what it is that they need us to do in terms of STI notifications, STI treatments, and how to engage partners in those uh, conversations. There isn't enough research for our adolescents, particularly that sit below the age of 18. These conversations and the interventions that have been already created often only focus on um, young women that are above the age of 18. And so there's definitely space for us to understand like how much, how old do you need to be to start having these conversations with your partner? Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. And I think for so many of us on the ground, um, I think your research is so relevant and so important. And I think of the number of partnerships that I have written. Um, when I have a participant in front of me, if we're lucky enough to recall them, if we have a positive result, we get them, we talk to them about partner notification, give them a partner slip. And when we do see them again, um, very, very often, they didn't even have the courage to hand over that slip. And if they did, did the partner actually go to the clinic, get treated? So um, no wonder we're not getting on top of um, so many STIs in our community. Pippa, can I can I respond to Laura? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Deborah. Yeah. I, I really think that the partner notification space has failed. And I have a colleague actually who's published this right, getting ready to publish this in her PhD, is that we take this a very Western approach of give this slip to your partner. And in our context of women that don't live together with their partner, they might have multiple partners. They might be bisexual and have a male and a female partner, for example. It really has failed. And I think it really behooves us to think of different models other than those partner slips and giving your partner condoms or treatment to really revolutionize this field of how to talk to your partner about sex, how to talk to your partner about HIV and STIs and pregnancy, um, because right now it really has failed. Thank you, Devorah. I love that word revolutionize. I think that is what we need. And while you've got that mic, will you keep it close? Because um, what I would, what what I think we'd all love to hear about is all the amazing work that you are doing, particularly in pregnant women, um, STI prevention, prep. It's so interesting. Please, can you let us all know um, know about more about your research and how it relates to everything that that we've been speaking about today. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to all the presenters. I'm so excited to implement the Pleasure Project in pregnancy. Who has been pregnant before in this room? Have you been pregnant before? <laughs> Who's had sex while they've been pregnant? <laughs> We've all had sex, or well, not all of us, but a lot of us have had sex while we're pregnant, right? So I think we also need to think about pleasure in pregnancy. And your body changes, right? You might have be less lubricated. You might have more sex drive or less sex drive. And so I think we need to revolutionize that as well, is how do you have sex after you have a baby? Um, all of those things, your body completely changes. During that time that your body changes, you have a lot of influence, you can have a lot of inflammation in your vagina and that can increase your risk of acquiring HIV and STIs. So when we talk about risk, we talk a lot about, oh, it's scary to be pregnant because you can get chlamydia and pass it on to your baby. Or you can get HIV and pass it on to your baby. But we also have to realize it's a beautiful time of life that you're growing something inside of you. And to take, take advantage of that opportunity to talk about 
sex and pleasure and an opportunity to have a, a healthy baby at this time. And so what we try to do is really frame it as the positive, as that this is a really opportunity for you to have a healthy baby and how are we going to work on that? And I wanna to talk to you later about how to integrate pleasure in, the, in working with pregnant women. But we work closely with um, pregnant and breastfeeding women to help them both prevent and treat STIs as well as HIV. And we find that this population of young women especially have really high rates of STIs. Almost half of them come in and we diagnose them with a chlamydia a gonorrhea, syphilis is on the rise as well. And that can be transmitted to the infant and it can also increase the risk of, of getting HIV. And so to your first presentation, which is by you and Catherine, it's really important to have multiple prevention products. And I, I don't see, I didn't see that in the innovation, but there is research being done on multiple preventions, how to prevent both pregnancy, STIs and HIV in one product. And we're really excited to see those products coming into the field as well in the coming year. Um, and it's really important to engage with the population to understand how they understand their own sexual behavior and their sexual risk when we develop messaging and counseling for that population. So thank you. Thank you, Devorah. Some very interesting and very important topics that you've that you've mentioned there. Um, and I know that we are that that I don't want to take up too much time before we hand over to the floor. But Sipu Setu, working on the ground um, with participants and all the challenges that you see. Um, when they come to the clinics, when they come to our mobile units, getting HIV testing, being tested for STIs, accessing PrEP, accessing STI treatment. Tell us a little bit about some of your experiences, some of the challenges you've come across, and maybe some of, some of the tips um, that I'm sure you've developed to, um, to work so closely with our participants. Um, thank you very much for the question. I'm currently working at Google to CHC, which is a clinic that is African dominated most of the time. So we as the peer navigators, we're at the side of the family planning and also the OPT side and also the STI side. Um, so basically at the clinic, we are the center of the clinic because when the youth is coming in and these young women, they meet us so we welcome them um, sitting in the benches and making sure that they feel welcome because most of the time um, when they're coming in into the clinic and they see old people, they tend to turn away or they are scared to ask the questions. So we as the youth, um, as the peer navigators, we try by all means to be there for them and welcome them at all times. So when they come in, they sit in the benches, we tell them about um, operations in the clinic, how it's done and everything how it's done. And we try by all means to give out the education about sexual and reproductive health because we believe that some of them, when they are coming at the clinic that lack the information. They are not sure about the contraceptions they want to use. Um, they have lack of knowledge about STIs as well. Some of them have symptoms, but they stayed at home and were not sure what kind of symptoms are having. And is it STI or it's normally anything that can vanish at, uh, at any space of time. So we are there giving them out the pamphlets, giving out that information and putting more emphasis about HIV testing as well, because that's the platform where we get um, to talk about PrEP, give out that information um, to recruit them so that they can know there's also PrEP at the clinic. Um, some of them put that uh, PrEP is not available at the clinics. Um, so we try to give out that information. Um, we believe that uh, most of them, when they are coming in the clinic, when they face the nurses for the first time, they are scared. And they have these questions aside that they would ask, uh, but they are scared because the nurses, they feel as if they are superior. They are their parents because they are older. And some of the nurses, some, most of the time, they turn them away, um, do not understand how they feel. So we as the peer navigators, we are in that platform where we see ourselves at that uh, bridging, that gap of being a parent and having that younger person that you can relate to at the clinic. So we understand that um, the young women and the adolescents, they are at the age um, or in the transitioning phase where they are th that's still trying to find out their identities. They are not sure which way to go to. So we try by all means to fill out that information. However, as we're working with them, we see that there's still a lack of knowledge, more especially about STIs. Um, they are ignorant. Um, they do not accept that they have them. They stay at home most of the time and only come if they see that um, the symptoms are intense and there's something that needs to be done. However, it takes time for them to get the information, but we try by all means to be there for them. And also the most challenge that we are having is the health um, care facility um, workers. 
they tend to not to be friendly to them. Um, they do not give out this type of information because when we first arrived at our clinic, um, there were no people to give out talks about these things. So they come with the information that they get from the street, um, information they are not sure about, just like PrEP. Some of them, they thought that um, PrEP is not for everyone that is HIV negative. Um, it's only for HIV people. So we're trying to correct that as well and tell them that PrEP is for HIV negative. It's a prevention method, actually, that prevents them from not getting HIV. And they have um, those questions that they would say, what would we, why would we take a pill to prevent ourselves not, from not taking the pill in the future? So we have also to be prepared as peer navigators to answer those questions and try to explain that PrEP is different from ART because it prevents your cells from not getting this virus. When you are taking ART, you already have the virus. So there's a huge gap and difference. So they have those misconceptions that they get from the outside. And others were asking and saying that um, PrEP makes you to be obese or when you stop taking PrEP, um, there's a high gap or high risk that you might get in HIV easily than before. So we try by all means to answer those questions. So I could say that you are the help center or help of information that we there at the clinic most of the time. Thank you. What a what a wonderful explanation. And I'm so grateful for all the participants that meet you at the day too. Um, all about education. And I can see it's now time to hand over to everyone here. So you can all have your say, ask some questions. I think Linda Gale is going to step in first, from what I can see. So, so let me really pose it to all four of you, and thanks, just brilliant talks, uh, you know, and with the lens of pleasure, would we do better at offering pre-exposure prophylaxis, latex, male and female condoms, the message U equals U, undetectable is untransmittable. If we framed it within this frame of getting better pleasure out of sexual experiences, is that not the step we need to take to actually say, let's not use the word risk, let's not work, use the words disease, but actually talk about this enhancing pleasure and enhancing the whole intimate experience of sex? <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, I was just reminded of one of these um, cards that I found on the Pleasure Project's website. It says, what is your favorite sex toy? And if you turn the card around, it gives different contraceptive methods. So I think part of it is just changing the language, starting to consider our safety as something that is sexy, something that we can take into our own hands, and not something that we have to do or else. I think really the way I understand the work of the Pleasure Project is just about the reframing. It's about introducing people to these ideas. Sexy is a bit of a, of a stretch, but I think it's more just in terms of the pleasure framework. So I'm just using the, the work that I've read and that there is evidence to support that using this framework can be beneficial. It's probably not going to be beneficial in all contexts. Um, and it could even be that additional programs need to be introduced where we speak more openly about pleasure and then begin to relate it to our individual work around um, contraceptives. But yeah, this initially when I saw this, I was a bit confused. But I think as, as I started exploring the work more, it made sense why people might be more reluctant to use contraceptives, even, especially if we know... Or, especially if, the, if there's this idea of condoms equals no pleasure um, for a lot of people. So it's reframing that. It's about making it pleasurable. It's about understanding, yeah, how we can take these things into our own hands. Lauren, um, sorry, not Lauren, um, Kylie. Well, you still got the mic, then Lauren. Yes. Um, a question from um, our online okay. um, participants. Um, Kylie, your positionality as a young colored woman definitely helped in eliciting responses. I'm reading these tips and wondering how to overcome my own ingrained beliefs and biases in potentially applying this to my research. I love that. Question from the online community. That's awesome. I was actually by, at the end of this presentation going to give homework for everyone. <laughs> um, but for me, I think having done this research, the biggest thing was just having some time to reflect on our own experiences. I think Pleasure is often something we don't think about, let alone speak about. So when it comes to, I remember when I first started asking people about their pleasure, they, they were stumped. 
they had no idea what to say. They didn't, like a lot of the women actually went blank and had zero idea of how to articulate the experiences because again, no one's ever asked them those questions. Um, so for me, and I think part of the methodology that I used was to really, I introduced a journal, which I think, I know not everybody's a writer, but I think just reflecting upon your own experiences, becoming aware of your own pleasure narrative and some of the ideas that initially informed your understandings of pleasure is really important and then starting to slowly just do the work, internal work of understanding how we can explore our own pleasure. And I think a big thing for me has also just been around worthiness. This idea of like, are we worthy of pleasure or is it about our partners? Um, so one of my initial questions was whose pleasure matters anyway? Because if we think about this in a gendered space, it is often our male partners who have the pleasure or when they orgasm, sex is done. So it's these, I decided, <laughs> so, um, and, and I think it's just starting to become aware of these inequalities within our own experiences, but also within our beliefs and, and the things that we were once taught or were not taught about our bodies and about the fact that we can experience pleasure. Because for example, I'm wearing a clitoris necklace today because it's my lucky charm, but ultimately the, the clitoris is the apparently only sexual organ that is dedicated for pleasure. It has 8,000 nerves and it can, in, right? right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. We we don't. I know, right? And this is the thing. But it's the fact that we we aren't even taught this basic information as young girls. But we know a lot more about our reproductive systems and about menstruation. But even that is limited to what our our teachers are comfortable teaching about. Um, so I think yes, a personal thing. Do your do the work. I have big plans after my PhD for how we can take this work further. So I'm very excited to just, to just be done with that stage and then we can talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one more question from the online community and then I'm noticing these hands. Lauren, a quick one for you. Is the partner notification work you're doing in the designated geography area such as Philippine Village? So, I'm not sure if you heard me there. Yeah, no. So, we're in the Clipman Sand Mutual Slaying area, which includes Philippi Village. Um, it expands, like, the mobile clinic area is actually all of the places that we are attempting to, um, like, run this program through. Um, and we can unfortunately see in both the public clinic and on the mobile services that we don't actually get good returns on paper slips. We also don't, I can I can say like less than 3% of partners return the paper slips. Um, and so that's why the emphasis is rather on the communication that's occurring because handing over a paper slip doesn't um, in any way ensure that the communication between the two partners is happening. And so often when a partner, when a male partner comes into the clinic, we try and start the conversation at the point of, can you tell us a little bit about why you're visiting? Can you tell us about who directed you towards us? Mm -hmm. um, to kind of get that understanding of how successful the notification process is happening, and as well as to understand whether the notification uh, process is working. Thank you, Lauren. Did I hear less than 3% returns? Of the paper slip, yes, of the paper slip. How is that for evidence it's not working? Okay, over to the floor, yes. Dr. Murray, thank you very much for a very insightful, inspiring uh, topic. My question is, uh, since our discussion has been in part about adolescent mental health issues, uh, instigators or factors, so would the topic of pleasure perspective not be misconstrued by women and young female to the extent that they might liken pillow talk to love and in doing so have their emotions incorrectly channeled, thus leading to more depression, low self-esteem, especially if their emotional needs are not met. And I remember having a discussion two years ago with adolescents and we were talking about sexuality and one of the adolescents came up with the saying that if you're not comfortable 
with looking at your naked body in the mirror, you're emotionally not ready to explore your sexuality. That's a tough one, I'll be honest. Um, I think for myself, pleasure has the potential to have an empowering effect on our communities. But I think there is fear around the word pleasure. And I, I would encourage us all to perhaps start thinking of alternative words that we could use. Um, like I was saying, perhaps instead of speaking about pleasure with adolescents, we could speak about we could speak about feeling good within our bodies. Um, so something I just I found within my own work was that a lot of women were incredibly, like you were saying, disembodied. Um, the way we come to learn about sex, often through so my own work speaks about or denklikate, so respectability, and then the opposite being ochat or promiscuous. So when you are framed within the spectrum, right, you have one or or the other option. Um, you are too scared of being labeled as ochat because that in itself has stigma. So you put on this facade of being ordentlik, um, or it becomes part of who you are. But I think what happens there is when we start framing our bodies around ordentlik and respectability, we become disembodied. We don't explore our bodies. We feel ashamed when we even think about touching ourselves. Um, and self-exploration doesn't even become an option. Um, a number of my participants spoke about their, their parents walking in on them um, in a self-pleasure act as a young child and how scarring that was and how ever since then they've never touched their bodies. So what happens then is that by the time they engage in partnered sexual pleasure, they rely on their partners and often male partners to show them what to do. And as we know, our male partners don't always know what to do either. So without any of this information, she is left wondering, now, does this feel good? What even is an orgasm? What even does pleasure feel like for me? Or are we done now that he's done? So these are the narratives that came up through my own work. And it just showed to me that the current version of sex and sexuality that we learn about, at least as colored women, because um, I can only speak about this population right now, is that it is detrimental to our sexualities and that it is very disembodying. Um, and through the knowledge, like I said, just by sharing the, the, the narratives within our interview spaces, women felt empowered. They felt that they wanted to go and explore something. They wanted to speak up within their sexual relationships with their partners. So I completely hear how it could have negative impacts. So speaking about pleasure could have negative impacts for our mental health. But I also want to encourage that it could have a positive effect um, because our current version isn't doing any better anyway. I hope that's okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my question is not specific to anyone. Um, I was wondering if it's possible uh, to maybe start a movement, um, a sex education versus pornography movement, because I feel like sex, uh, pornography is more accessible uh, to teenagers as much as um, it's age restricted, but it's easily accessible. They they always know how to um, access it. And um, the sad reality is that um, pornography, for me, in my opinion, it promotes unsafe sex. I don't remember like in my teenage years when I used to be <laughs> somehow, you understand? I don't remember seeing a video where uh, there would be like, oh, wait a minute, let me get a condom. You yeah, understand? It's always random sex scenes with random people. And I don't see anything, um, I don't see any positive education in that. And it's the most easily accessible thing. And I also believe that it creates um, unrealistic expectations from your partner, from your real partner, because the 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 the, the sex um the porn stars are always sexy, what 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 what, and then now your 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 partner maybe is breastfeeding as is not as sexy as the porn star, and then now you start to um body shame the real women. You it creates unrealistic expectations. So. I'm just wondering if there's a possibility of pushing more sex education 
that will uh, promote safe sex, realistic expectations, and then uh, kind of uh, suppress porn a bit. Yes. <laughs> I think, I think, I think here, here, I think we all agree, absolutely, we'll be part of your team fighting <laughs> for all of this. Um, <laughs> and I think that, um, that Kylie's probably, all her work is, is doing a lot, a lot with that too. Lauren, it looks like you want to respond. Um, yeah, it's not to say that we shouldn't start the movement. I'm not saying that there isn't space for like new projects, but I think that we must also acknowledge the work that is happening. There are several um, advocacy groups that are um, focused on ensuring that children don't have access to pornography. There are groups that are parents and educational groups that are focused on ensuring that um, children don't have, that, that we teach parents how to lock um, they are private networks to ensure that their children don't have access. So those are educational programs, they're advocacy programs that already exist in Cape Town and in um, KwaZulu Natal and in uh, Gauteng. Um, but I also want to say that we need to acknowledge that currently, I believe the Department of Education is already implementing what they consider to be the comprehensive sexual and sexuality education piece. Um, and initially it used to fall under LO, but I think that the scope of that work is changing to not only cover um, discouraging pornographic content, but also the promotion of consent, the promotion of um, our adolescents understanding like the, br the broad scope of um, sexuality and identity. So there is work being done, um, not to say that you shouldn't start a movement. Mm. I think maybe the movement is to get that work that is being done out there so yes. that we all know where to access it, how to access it. Yes. Kylie. No, in addition, in addition to that, you could also perhaps explore feminist porn, which attempts to rewrite the narrative of sex. Yes, I've got some supporters there because it tends to um, emphasize empowerment and consent and, and agency far more than our traditional porn. So sometimes it just means like changing your search engine just a little bit or the input in there, um, and you'll end up with a very different experience of porn. There's also another amazing resources I want to recommend you look at called OMG Yes. It's a website that ultimately shows you the different techniques of female self-sexual pleasure. Um, it's, it's quite explicit, but I think part of the idea is that we want to start normalizing these things, um, or these conversations rather. Um, and then as far as I know, the Pleasure Project also advocates for safe sex within porn. So they encourage the use of contraceptives, um, of condoms, and they're starting to push those kind of discourses. So I completely agree with you and I want to join your team. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. Yes, not at all to undermine the queer community. Um, yes, so there is so much. There's so much that we can be doing differently, but I completely agree. It's it's very different for a teenager to just search porn because we know it's accessible rather than being told there's a type of porn that you may want to engage with, which would create the, or get rid of those unrealistic expectations later on in life. Thank you. The sharing of resources is, is really so valuable and what this is really also all about. Sorry, one more thing, Kylie. Last Absolutely. thing, I, I promise. No, um, so no, part, no. <laughs> part of the work that I'm doing with the Pleasure Project, which I didn't actually mention today, was that my intention is to create my own database next year called Pleasure Ed. And that's going to have specific resources that we can hopefully all have access to. The idea is that it's going to be this A to Z of sexual pleasure, and you'd be able to click on a letter and it will take you to the concepts that might, might be relevant to pleasure because I feel that a lot of our information that we have on pleasure right now is scattered and it's not always easy for us to discern what is good information and not so great information. So yes, just a little plug there. I don't know when it's going to be released, but it's something that will hopefully help with the resources. Hi, um, my name is Lisa. I just wanted to give some context to understand my biases. <laughs> um, I work in the intersection of technology, sex um, and youth. And I was curious for Dr. Lauren, my <laughs> used to it. <laughs> um, so 
My question is, in your research about um, SDI partner notification, obviously, you know, with the context of this being South Africa and um, violence against women and all kinds of fears that I'm sure plays a part in uh, why these notifications don't happen. Was there any um, things that you found or ideas that you have about how the digital space can support in perhaps, I, I don't know, like a moonshot idea in my head is like having a, or subscribing to some kind of database as like a sexual health database with like a way to verify that you are who you are and to be notified if perhaps someone in your network whom you've had relations with um, has tested positive for something and there would be a much more anonymized way of receiving that information. Um, to answer your question, I think it's about what's available to us as South Africans. So the American system and the European system has a database that's exactly like that. It's linked to your ID, you verify by fingerprints and then your phone number. So similar to our RICA system, you have to register your phone number that um, shows that you're active on that ID. The only other process that they've added to that is to link your WhatsApp or your um or whatever similar chat-based um, mechanism that you're currently used using. And so if I go into that system and I test positive, it automatically requests that I enter anonymously. I don't even need the doctor. I can enter all my partner's names and I can confirm their cell phone numbers. Um, and that process of anonymity to enter your partners into the database actually works really well to identify all the people that need to receive what is either an SMS or an anonymous email. Um, but I want to say that the cost by governments and the initiatives that that are and the grants that go towards that kind of system is so expensive. And I don't know how feasible is probably the appropriate word that is in South Africa. Um, I mean, we are we've been for like the past 35 years reliance on a paper-based piece of slip and that for me it doesn't work like I, I can't imagine I can imagine losing the slip of paper quite easily given it's me I can imagine um, the consequences of handing over this piece of paper when I don't want to even open my mouth to say that I've tested positive for this thing and I can't imagine the circumstance and we under which we could um we could just simply tell a person to you go tell your partner that's not working um i would hope that eventually south africa would get to the points where we send we we, we had the ability to maybe have a toll free number that you could say um call this number or or a referral for partner therapy would be yes uh the legality of uh, okay, anyway, yeah. So um, as Dr. DeVore is saying, we've even gotten to the point where if I test positive for an STI, they get, they're giving me treatment, one set of treatment to give to my partner. Now I have to decide which of my partners are going to get this STI treatment from me. So you can see as, as much as I would love for us to have a database, as much as I would love for us to automate the database, I think that there needs to be some consideration for cost um, because we don't have, the kind of database that exists in other countries. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Lauren. And I knew this was going to happen. So many interesting questions, so many interesting topics. Um, but we do have to bring our questions to an end. But I'm going to ask you all just to stand up and stretch just for five minutes while our entertainment or the tech is being set up. And then we have a short but amazing performance coming up in about five minutes. So just have a stretch and, um, and we'll introduce you to our entertainer shortly. <laughs> 